Um, so I've got to give you the setup. So this is a UDL anthem. Um, and it's a Lady Gaga song called um, Born This Way. So some of you have heard Born This Way. And, uh, but the setup of the show is um, that, uh, particularly this episode, but it's in general, that the people who are in the glee club, gleeks, you'll hear your, your kids talk about them, um, are kids that are not perfect. And it's a great show for that. They are kids, some of them are too fat, some of them are too skinny, some of them don't look right, some of them want to get a nose job, some of them, you know. And there's the socias, the really cool kids, and the glee club are not that. They're the kids that are marginalized, typically, in schools, although they still look pretty good, I have to say. <laughs> but in any case, they're not perfect. And they got problems and so on. And the show's about how the glee club is central to them doing well. Okay, because the other kids are popular and socials and all that. And, um, and they, of course, go through life's trials and tribulations and get uh, smart and all that. So this episode that this segment is from, which is the Lady Gaga song, um, has, uh, the whole episode is about kids facing up to what they're insecure about. And it's neat because every one of them in the whole show has something that they've been embarrassed and humiliated and, uh, and uh, don't like about themselves. Uh, and uh, like one of the big segments is about a, uh, one of them is trying to get a nose job. And the other people are trying to convince her, don't get a nose job, that's you. And she's saying, it's not me, I want to be like her. And so on, so that you can see. And, and so everybody's got something, you do. There's something you got that you wish you're embarrassed about or what's the word? Uh, anyway, uh, something that is not your strength. So uh, they kind of get together to kind of uh, announce this to the world and get over it. And the lead character you'll see begin has, is uh, gay. And some people know he's gay, but a lot of people don't. And so the first thing he's going to do is he's going to come out to the entire audience. Okay? And their coming out will be symbolized. They're going to open up. They've made t-shirts that literally are stamped with what they're embarrassed about what they don't feel good about themselves about, but they've had to come to grips with. Okay, I shouldn't be showing you this slide ahead of time because you're trying to figure that out. But, um, okay, so here is uh, the first guy is announcing he's gay and you'll be able to figure out what happens after that. But everything you see on their t-shirts is um, the thing. Okay, a couple things I love. One, the kid in the wheelchair is concerned about the four eyes. <laughs> and he's a regular character, which is fabulous. It's not like, you know, and so on. The one that has Lebanese, you got it. I was, had to explain the in-jokes about it. It's actually that she was given that by one of her friends who mistakenly, she meant lesbian. <laughs> and she, but she, mis, she misspelled lesbian, came out Lebanese. So if you're a regular, you know this, and I didn't, I'm right. Um, so, uh, and, um, anyway, a, so a great UDL anthem, you know. Let's, uh, let's accept who we really are and go from there and do great things. It's kind of, it's a nice message. And I love it. I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I don't know how much of you watch Fox News, but in the U.S., Fox News is a very conservative uh, channel. And uh, so to have this sort of show that's saying, it's, I like boys, on the Fox News channel, is, I mean the Fox regular channel, is pretty interesting. And it's their most popular show in the US. So they don't want to take it down. But if you go to the website, it's full of this you know, incredible people just angry, saying, how can Fox News be promoting gays and lesbians doing what they want to do? And, uh, you know, it's really an interesting phenomenon. But the ratings are so high, they don't want to change it, blah, blah, blah. OK. Um, I want to just alert you to a, a fabulous book. Um, and this book also came up when I was doing the research for, for my talk. And it's just an extraordinary book. It's called Extraordinary Measures. Disability in Music. And um, I just want to show you a few of the chapters to give you a sense of what it's about. The first part of the book is essentially talking about the great composers of Western music and their disabilities. 
And the argument is basically that Beethoven, Bach, Schoenberg, Faber, these people, their disability was key to what made their music great. And there's this fabulous, I didn't do it here, but I, play, I played th that night when I did the talk, Beethoven's Eroica. And Beethoven's Eroica, many people consider the most powerful change in music history. And people thought it was about um, Napoleon, because he put Napoleon's name on the front of the piece. But in fact, if you read his diaries, as this guy did, that the whole thing that the Beethoven's Eroica is, is Beethoven coming to grips with his deafness and that the Eroica is a triumphant opening of the shirt of Beethoven to say, I'm deaf, but I'm a musician. And just like out of, uh, 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 out of uh, what's the name of that show? Glee. Glee. It's <laughs> Beethoven's glee moment. And it is three times as long as anybody had ever heard a symphony. And it has this incredibly triumphant, all this whole thing. And it just expands beyond what anybody had ever heard music do before. And it's an announcement. It's a coming out. I am deaf, but I'm still a musician. It's fabulous. Anyway, so he does that. He tells the stories of these people and their disability. And what his point is, is that this is the great music of our history. Come and get a grip on that these people all had disabilities when they wrote their music. And it's, we shouldn't have tried to fix them, <laughs> is part of his message. But the two best chapters are the end chapters. Look at the titles. Performing Music and Performing Disability. Prodigious Hearing, Normal Hearing, and Disablest Hearing. Just extraordinary titles for chapters. And um, I just want to show you just a few of the things that he says in these chapters, because he writes beautifully. Um, and he's telling about, in this case, um, um, I forget her first name, Glennie, who's a deaf percu percussionist. Uh, you might have seen her on uh, YouTube or l lots of places. She's a, been knighted in England. Um, she's just a, this a world-class percussionist. She's deaf, not what you expect to do when you're deaf. So just a few lines from her. Because I had to concentrate with every fiber of my body and brain, I experienced music with a profundity that I felt was God-given and precious. I didn't want to lose that special gift. Remember, this is a deaf person. This is her. Skip that for a moment. You can go to her website. Glennie's deafness has shaped the way she makes sense of music and produces music, causing her to attend to the tactile and visual aspects of sound. She feels and sees the music. She actually always plays barefooted. So that she, it, it's this fabulous description of, and it's right neuro, neuroscience wise. Your ear is an extension of your touch senses. Your ear is just feeling the touch of air vibrating on it, specialized to do, but it's a touch sense. And what she's doing is she's hearing with her whole body because her ears don't work. So she's letting the vibrations feel on her body. So it's like a big organ, a big, huge ear organ that's hearing the music with her body. It's an incredible description. Read it sometime. And she sees it. And she watches music. By attending in her performances to the sights and feelings of the sound she hears and produces, she performs barefoot and with extraordinary visual intensity. She makes her deafness visible to the audience, simultaneously performing her music and her deafness. Beautiful. I love this way this guy writes. Disablest hearing is part of a larger effort within disability studies toward empowerment, in which an oppressed and silenced group begins to assert the power of self-representation. Instead of trying to normalize people with disabilities, we listen to what they have to say. Instead of turning them into normal hearers, we learn to hear in ways that challenge normal hearing. And remember that video I showed earlier? when the, what they did was instead of trying to fix the person's physical disability, they listened to how does he move? How can he express himself? And let's use that to make music with. And this is the same kind of quote. It says, let's pay attention to what they have. My essential point is that the range of human hearing is wider than generally recognized. The boundary between normal and abnormal hearing is a construction of fiction. We cannot begin to dismantle that wall until we can define better what lies in either side. In other words, our, our understanding of hearing is too narrow, because we're just talking about what you do with your plantum temporale. 
that there's a broader expanse of hearing that we're not so good at. Dogs are great at, blah, 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 all sorts of things. False claims of universality are the least attractive feature of the literature on music cognition, which moves too easily from showing that something is widespread to asserting that it is therefore normal, natural, and hardwired into the brain. Gorgeous stuff. In fact, there are many kinds of bodies, many kinds of brains, and many kinds of musical hearing. In our theorizing and in our pedagogy, I think we would do well to acknowledge the limitations of normal hearing. This is the penultimate UDL message. Acknowledge the limitations of normal hearing, that Glennie hears things you don't hear. Your dog hears things that you don't hear. We, what we call normal, is not normal. It is just common. And what this whole book is about is that we don't have a rich enough sense of what music is because we're too disabledist. It's really interesting. And then I just want to play one last thing for us. Um, uh, second Glee episode. Um, and I think this one's self explain No, I have to say one thing about it and then I'll be done. Um, so, two things about this. It's a Beatles song, imagine, so you can sing along if you want to. But sing on, sing on pitch if you're going to sing. <laughs> and uh, the set piece is that there's a choir of deaf singers. Those are the people in the red. They're from a school for the deaf. And they're made fun of by the socials in the school because there's a contest that's going to happen, uh, a, a, a choir contest, and the socials go, why are the deaf kids coming? All they do is honk, because you know, which is exactly the way deaf people feel this kind of, people say that about them. They have, even if they speak, it doesn't sound right. A honking, so it's like a perfect line in this movie. Anyway, so they come and they sing in this contest, but the Gleek people, you'll see them sitting. The people that are in the Gleek, remember these kids are marginalized already. They know what this means. And watch them watch and watch what happens. <laughs> <laughs>